These days, Marvel and DC can just get lovable goofball comedians to diet and exercise like they're training for the NFL Combine to make their millions. But before the Disneyfication of superheroes, they often had to rely on weird sex stuff. And I got some real hairy action head your way. And that's what we're all about here. The bonkers, the embarrassing, the unbelievable stories of love and lust that these publishing powerhouses once conjured up to titillate young Americans with disposable income. We're talking about the incredible incestual Hulk, Swamp Thing's sex potato, and Superman's clever workaround for kissing your cousin. This is Cannonball. Number four. The Hulk only has eyes for his cousin. Hulk 2000 Volume 1 is a classic tale of a young man's confused, enraged horniness. Stay straight. It's emo. It's problematic. It's basically Marvel's Pinkerton. God you have Japanese girls. While 2008's The Incredible Hulk was brave enough to acknowledge that the slightest amount of friction on Bruce Banner's neener is enough to summon the Hulk like a genie, this story asks the question, what if the Hulk himself wants to get it in? The comic spends 15 whole pages showing the Hulk moping around, mourning the tragic, lonely life he's come to lead, and also trying to sell you Cheez-Its. When we finally meet his cousin, She-Hulk, she's also sad in some kind of psychic solidarity with He-Hulk, which is an important lesson for hormonal young boys out there. If you keep your feelings to yourself, the women in your life will intuit what's wrong and make it all better. And that's exactly what She-Hulk will spend the rest of this comic trying to do. When Hulk throws a giant temper tantrum in Central Park, She-Hulk suggests that maybe she can reason with this living embodiment of senseless, uncontrollable rage. Vision helpfully mentions his new technique of looking stuff up on the internet. According to monkey science, Hulk is simply a horny baboon. Like many primates, he's trying to assert dominance by beating up his rivals, and also his potential mates. When it becomes clear that he sees She-Hulk as his only potential mate, Vision bravely it decides that this isn't his problem, saying, quote, they both share the same genetic traits, perhaps only they can intuit how best to resolve this. Look, man, if you want to talk genetics, humans share 44% of their DNA with bananas. If a crazed banana was hell-bent on porking me in Central Park, I would hope my coworkers would step in. She-Hulk's approach to resolving this is to overtly seduce him, then let him down easy with those classic lines we've all heard before. You're not my type, and you're my cousin. Kevin, I'm not happy with what's happening in my story. Hulk whines about how smart and strong he is and then resumes his temper tantrum, which, by the way, started with smashing a cop car. Iron Man is like, maybe we should stop this horny, angry idiot? before he kills somebody? But She-Hulk basically says no, he's got blue balls of rage and he might get sick if he doesn't go drop kick the Bronx. You can see this whole thing playing out in a state school frat house. Angry bro makes a scene. The object of his affection tries to settle him down. Everyone else justifies looking the other way while he punches a hole in the wall. I guess there is more harmful frat trope behavior that a hero could engage in. DC, maybe you'd like to try your hand? Number three, Swamp Thing grooms a teenager and then doses her. Abigail Arcane is the daughter, the niece, and the ex-wife of Swamp Thing's various nemeses. She and Swamp Thing shared over 10 years of adventures before her human husband finally croaked and they could be together once and for all. Daddy issues aside, the real problem is that Abigail was 17 the first time Swamp Thing saved her in 1973's Swamp Thing number three. I'm not even gonna bother looking up the age of consent in Transylvania. I'm just gonna say this. Swamp Thing, you're on thin ice, buddy. Swamp Thing. You are amazing. Fast forward to 1982's Swamp Thing number 34. A 29 year old Abigail is visiting her becomed husband on his deathbed when a moist ficus in the hospital lobby catches her eye. She's made up her mind. She is going to f the Swamp Thing. To his credit, he explains that boning him, quote, would be unpleasant for you. She insists they don't need to have a physical relationship as long as they have each other. And he starts to panic. He paces into the filthy, stagnant water and grunts out a sex potato from his heart. She agrees this is already quite unpleasant, but agrees nonetheless to take a bite of his hideous tuber, if that's what he's into. He neglects to mention that she's about to trip absolute balls. She starts having vivid and beautifully rendered hallucinations where she appears to wear Swamp Thing like a god <laughs> power loader and even fucks the very earth itself. Oh, and in case you were wondering, Swamp Thing's kisses taste like lime and his vegetable testicles taste like cardamom. 
It's only after their orgasmic trip is over that the really dark stuff begins. Despite the morally dubious foundation of this relationship and this particular sexual encounter, it's actually Abigail who gets in trouble with the law. In a later issue, she's charged with cruelty to nature for her part in this filthy, psychedelic orgy. As their relationship progresses, things only get worse. They want to have a kid, so Swamp Thing pilots his human friend's meat body to boink a baby into her belly. She wakes up one day to find Swamp Thing spontaneously mimicking her pregnant body. He then gives birth to a baby version of himself, and then makes the conscious decision to become the infant son of his once lover. For some reason, she accepts his decision at which point he spontaneously becomes adult Swamp Thing once more. This isn't to say that DC is actively encouraging learned helplessness and other man-baby behavior, but this particular couple isn't exactly providing a strong model of a healthy relationship. Maybe Superman has a stronger moral compass. Number two, Superman will only settle down for his cousin, god <laughs> damn it. 1938's Action Comics number 289 makes no bones about its incestual, pedophilic undertones, with Superman's 16-year-old first cousin saying, quote, the woman he is finally going to wed looks exactly as I will when I grow up. Right there on the cover. To clarify, Supergirl worries that Superman will never choose a wife and will end up alone forever. She takes it upon herself to orchestrate a woman hunt across space and time, first trying to hook him up with famous women in history. When that doesn't work, she pulls some Ghost of Christmas Future shit, <laughs> successfully goading Superman to hook up with Saturn Girl only in the future, where she's ever so slightly less girly. That one doesn't work out either, and Supergirl comes clean about her matchmaking scheme. Superman had previously claimed that his whole reason for embracing bachelorhood is so that he can devote his life to defending Earth. Well, it turns out that's not entirely true. The reality is that he totally, definitely, exclusively wants to marry his cousin, who again, is 16. He launches into a suspiciously lengthy diatribe about how rubbing on your cousin is both okay and not okay? See, it's illegal on Krypton, where they're both from, but he makes sure to point out that it is legal in some countries right here on Earth. And he explains all of this while lustily thumbing her chin, like he's about to devour her head like a heap of hamburgers. So it's not a leap to say, this dude was hoping to smooch his second teenager of the day. But Supergirl does him one better. She hops on the computer and quickly finds a slightly older, practically identical version of herself on a distant planet somewhere. Ignoring all the crime on the planet he swore to protect, Superman barrels through space to go tongue kiss the carbon copy of the girl he probably babysat at some point. At times it almost feels like Supergirl pulled a Dick Cheney here, offering to find the right person for the job and discovering, what do you know, she was the right person all along. But despite her odd fixation with Superman's love life, there's no indication that she harbors any kind of crush whatsoever. Superman was the one who made it weird with his well-rehearsed justification of cousin loving. And she responds by immediately finding a literal decoy and getting him to scurry off to another galaxy. I'd say watch your daughters, but unless you've got some Kryptonian blood in you, you're probably safe. If, on the other hand, you happen to be an Avenger, you may want to keep an eye on your sons. Number one. Miss Marvel gets Stockholm syndromed by her infant son. Tell me if you've heard this one before. An inexplicably naked young man strikes up an amorous relationship with a maternal figure who goes to great lengths to explain that she's not technically his real mom. Yeah, Marvel was pumping out classic porn storylines at least as far back as 1963. So we're still doing that. Avengers number 200 is an unfortunate tale of the time Miss Marvel fell in romantic love with her son on the day he was born. Hold your judgment though, she's somehow not the villain of this story. It starts off with the Avengers returning to their mansion to find Miss Marvel fully eight months pregnant. She insists that she's only been pregnant for three days, and furthermore, she hadn't even boned anybody. A weird thing to tell your coworkers for sure, but easier than describing the truth. She was immaculately concepted while on an airplane over New Jersey. What's in New Jersey? While her fellow Avengers run around doing some sitcom uncle sh**, <laughs> this miracle child starts rapidly aging because there's no time to waste when incest is the game. He's a grown man by the time she finally sees him, at which point she's as surprised as any of us to find she's a little bit horny for him. The man-child, who names himself Marcus, explains that he's in fact the son of Immortus, one of the superest supervillains out there. See, Immortus ruled over Limbo, which exists outside of time. He got horny one eternity and kidnapped a human woman. 
It's fine. She was about to die on the Titanic. Everybody's feeling bad because it's party time. He forced her to bear his child and raise it on a little time island inside of Limbo. It's fine. He used his machines to make her fall in love with him. Eventually, though, thanks to some time-related conundrums and shenanigans, Marcus's mother drifts back to Earth and his father disappears entirely. A couple eternities later, Marcus realized that he too had become a bit horny and followed in his father's footsteps. He kidnapped Miss Marvel and, with a little help from his dad's forced consent machines, got her pregnant with, once again, a fetus version of himself. By the way, that's the implied backstory of all borderline incest porn. After finally hearing why the hell she just speed ran pregnancy, Miss Marvel declares, quote, I think that might be a relationship worth giving a chance, and agrees on the spot to go back to limbo with this slime ball. Well, she's obviously being mind controlled, and surely the Avengers intervene, right? I mean, it's a little uncool that they all ogled her while her infant son was crowning, and then they repeatedly asked if her pussy was okay. But when it really mattered, they all stepped up and, oh, actually they helped her abuser isolate and kidnap her. Yeah, before any of the women could return and weigh in on the situation, Thor immediately hand delivers the new couple back to limbo while Iron Man and Hawkeye agree that Yep, everything probably worked out for the best. Great work, fellas. I'm sure Scarlet Witch and the Wasp will understand when you explain that you just ushered your coworker off to another dimension with the adult baby you just met, also he wouldn't have to spend another eternity not porking. Thanks for watching this episode of Cannonball. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and let us know in the comments if you know of any tips or tricks for hooking up with your cousin.